Good morning, First Assembly family. I'm excited today to share with you week two of our series, Infinitely More. I believe with all of my heart, God has incredible things for our lives, and not just for us, but things He wants to do in and through us. And so uh, I hope you get a chance to journey through this with us over the next few weeks as we bridge the gap from uh, the day we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus on Easter and Pentecost Sunday when uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out and the new church, uh, the New Testament church begins, which includes us. Let me just extend a couple of quick things. First of all, thank you. Thank you for giving. You guys have been so incredibly generous. Uh, I just can't say thank you enough during this incredibly difficult season. And then as Pastor Kim and Pastor Nikki said at the beginning, connect with us, churchinfo at yanktonassembly.com. If you have prayer needs or questions or anything, make sure you do that. Hey, let, let's pray together quick. Prepare hearts for what God wants to speak to us today. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity for us to dig into your word. God, I pray now you just anoint the message this morning. God, I pray that it would touch our hearts. And God, that we would grab a hold of what you're wanting to teach us during this season. In your mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All of us in our lives have a specific thing that God has prepared for us. In fact, Scripture tells us that from the beginning of time, before we were even thought of, that God had begun to lay out plans for those of us that would know Him. And it's an encouraging thought, but sometimes it's a little daunting because we, we have things run through our mind like, what if I miss it? Or, God, what if you ask me to do something that I'm not comfortable with? I remember when I was a kid, I used to, as I would wrestle with the idea of being called to ministry, uh, I would start to negotiate with God and say, God, I'm cool if you send me here, just don't send me there. And it's so funny looking back at that some of the thoughts, and sometimes some of the fears that I had about what God may do through my life if I let him have full control of it. The reality is this, is that God's plan is incredible if we will just join with him in what he's doing. So I want to unpack a little bit of that this week. Ephesians 3.20, this is our theme verse for this series. We shared it last week. Let me share it again with you this morning. Out of the New Living, it says this, now, all glory to God, who is able, through, a, through his mighty power, at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. There's a lot packed into that. We started last week kind of diving into what that means for us, looking at literally the life of Jesus, the journey of Jesus from uh, the beginning of his public ministry until his death and resurrection, kind of almost working backwards, in a sense, from Easter up to the day of Pentecost. But here's the reality. God is able, not, not us and ourselves, but him working within us through it, through his power. Last week, we looked at the idea that, that God starts with the end in mind. In fact, we went all the way back to the first prophetic promise of the sending of Jesus to die on the cross for us, found all the way back in Genesis. If you missed that, you can check it out uh, on really whatever platform you're watching on this morning. And we talked about the idea that ultimately that Jesus was leading to and then through the cross. And we want to build off of that today as we begin to trace the journey of Jesus during his time on this earth. This week, we're going to look at the idea that God has a vision for our life and that his vision is infinitely more than you and I, as the writer of Ephesians says, might ask or think. Often, we start with the, well, God, yeah, but you don't know me. And then we're like, okay, well, wait, you are God, so you do know me. We start with all the reasons why that shouldn't be. I want to tell you today that God recognizes and knows who you are, and he's comfortable with that. He sees your potential. I think often when you and I, when we look in the mirror, we begin to look at the thing that God created and question, you know, was God having a bad day? And the reality is he wasn't. He, he knows you. He, he, his scripture says that you were knit together in your mother's womb, that there is purpose in that. I love as you trace the life of Jesus, and we're going to start today really kind of back at, at the beginning of his public ministry when Jesus was beginning to build his team, right? those that would walk with him for three and a half years of public ministry. And Jesus starts in some really unlikely places with some unlikely people. And I love this picture because it, it paints a picture for us. All four Gospels, 
show in different ways, different moments of the calling of the disciples. And, and I'm going to take one of those today and, and, and talk to you about the idea of preparation. What does it look like for us to be prepared? Because I think when we hear that idea of infinitely more, we often sit back and say, okay, God, I'm ready for that, and I'll just show up. And God's saying, no, listen, there's a preparation that has to happen, that God wants to do more in you. And so what I want you to hear this morning is this, is if you will grab a hold of that promise that he has infinitely more for you, that, that if you'll do that, that God will then begin to work in you. Listen, it's not overnight. Think about this. The disciples had three and a half years of training and walking and talking and seeing the miracles of Jesus, and yet we find them uh, on Resurrection Sunday hiding in a room in disbelief. Now, that didn't disqualify them. In fact, we're going to look at that a little bit later, but it does help us to understand that failure is part of the process. Jesus isn't scared of failure. He's not scared of, of my faults or your faults, and he wants to include us in this process. Here's what I do know is that Jesus saw infinitely more in the lives of the disciples he would call to participate with him than you and I could ever imagine. Let me encourage you today as we look at God's Word. I want you to, to kind of personalize this today, if you would. Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says this, and I'm in the NIV, by the way. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. I want to pause here for just a second. I want you to note something in the text. Jesus comes along the scene, a very, a very normal scene. He's desiring to teach, and there's these fishermen. I just want to paint a picture for you that have been out all night. We'll find out a little bit later, working hard. And so they are literally putting away their gear from a hard night's work. Verse 3, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Just catch the wording for just a moment. Because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a great large number of fish that their nets began to break. Verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I mean, get that picture for just a moment. The, the boat that they had worked all night in, hadn't caught anything, they're, they're ready to put it away. Jesus, a carpenter, by the way, says, go out, put it down. And it says they catch this huge, huge catch of fish. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at, his knee, at, at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. When Jesus said to Simon, don't. Don't be afraid, for now you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I love that picture, picture of Jesus going out, and, and, and you can almost see it in your mind. He's there. He's teaching along the seashore. And he already has in his mind, because the pattern of Scripture is Jesus would pray. He knew what the Father was asking him to do. I'm sure that Jesus already knew that Peter was this person, and, and then James and John's partner, that he had marked to be one of his disciples. But he comes along, and it's almost like this, this test of obedience that's laid out before Peter. He, he sits in Peter's boat and says, hey, will you push out and let me teach? And Peter, after a long night of hard work, does so. And then Peter, after that, Jesus says, go out into deep water and let down your nets. It's interesting because these men were experienced fishermen. 
And yet there was something about Jesus where even though it seemed crazy, it seemed like, man, we've already done all this work, that Peter was obedient to Jesus. And it was in that moment that this miracle takes place, this miracle catch of fish that really ultimately had nothing to do with the fish, had everything to do with Peter seeing Jesus for who he was. What's interesting to me in this text is where Jesus is at. We find Jesus on the seashore teaching the people. He's in a boat of fishermen of ordinary people in just an ordinary place in his time. And it's in that place where Jesus calls these men to come and follow him. We would assume that it would have been in the temple or the synagogue. Maybe uh, Jesus would have found himself by some of the rabbinical schools or uh, some of the other priests in the area, other young Jewish men who were looking for a teacher to lead them. But no, Jesus finds ordinary people. In fact, because they were already working, most of them, ha having been trained as young men, had probably already moved on from that phase of their life. Hear me this morning. Jesus is far less concerned with our age and our occupation and our perceived abilities than we are. Jesus said, that's, that's nothing for me. Remember, the whole idea of this is that God's purpose for our lives is infinitely more than we're currently living. I believe with all of my heart that as the people of God, if we would truly walk in step with God, we would see him do amazing things in our lives and the lives of our families. I believe that most believers are living at a level lower than where God would have them live. So when I say to you, God has infinitely more, I believe that with all of my heart. This isn't just for part of you or some of you. And listen, if you're newer with us, I believe this for you as well. You connecting with us during this season isn't an accident. And, and, and I want you to hear me today. This has nothing to do with age. And you, know, you say, well, listen, I'm, I've already kind of done those things. Jesus doesn't care about that. He wants to continue to walk out his plans for your life. As Jesus is building his dream team, his team of world changers, he finds himself in a fishing boat with a fisherman named Simon. We know him as Peter, Simon Peter. Jesus asks him to do some honestly kind of ridiculous things. Right after a long day's work, let me use your boat. I want you to go out. And Peter actually says to him, he says, are you sure? We, we fished all night. And Jesus says, go out and lower your nets. I wonder what would have happened had Peter just said no. Listen, I don't believe God gives up on us, but maybe just maybe sometimes if we're not careful, we miss out on the opportunities that God is laying before, before us. And then ultimately the big thing, and it's not even so much a question, at the end of the passage we read, Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. For now, from now on, you will fish for people. And it's almost not even a question that Peter responds to. And Peter's response is one of action. So they pulled their boats on shore, left everything, and followed him. That refrain is recorded over and over again throughout the four Gospels about the lives of the disciples, that they left everything to follow him. Hear me this morning. Peter's obedience laid the, laid the groundwork to be used by God. First thought I have for you this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write down. It'll be on the screen this morning. Or excuse me, on your screen this morning. It says this, Jesus is looking for obedience, not just ability. Your greatest ability is your availability. All right? Why? Because Jesus is looking for people who are willing to be obedient our life will be a series of moments where we have opportunity to step out in obedience. I can look back at my own life over and over again, opportunities to step out in obedience. And Jesus never says, what are your qualifications? He just simply says, will you obey? I remember a particular season. I was later in my high school years. I had known specifically in my life uh, from the age of six that God had called me to be a pastor. But as life had moved on and I wasn't quite in that still child life faith portion of my life, 
I, I really began to wrestle with and question God's call. Not that I didn't believe he called me. I began to wrestle with the cost. I had some adults in my life at the time who uh, asked me some pretty significant questions. Uh, part of them weren't believers. Things like, how will you ever take care of your family? That's, that's a dead-end career. And honestly, I had to begin to wrestle with the selfishness inside of me. And see, my selfishness went something like this. But God, I, I want this, this, and this for my life. I want to be able to do this, this, and this. And for me at that moment, as a high school student, those things were wrapped highly into uh, money, just being honest. My potential earnings for the future. And that one thought began to uh, cripple my thoughts toward what it meant to follow God. Not that I didn't want to be a Christian, but was I willing to be obedient? Listen, all of us have choices to make in this idea of obedience. Jesus is looking for obedience, not just ability. Now, your situation may be different. Maybe you're already into your life and you're sitting back and saying, but pastor, I'm only, and you fill in the blank, I'm only a, a teacher or I'm only a small business owner or a farmer or an electrician or an engineer. Maybe you say, I'm just a factory worker. I'm just a student. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. I believe with all of my heart, Jesus asks all of us to steps of obedience. And if we will be obedient, he can make up for the ability. If we get past that hurdle, then some of you say, well, you know, I, I, I didn't go to college or, you know, I didn't even finish high school. Hear me this morning. Jesus isn't concerned about your job or your education. He's concerned about whether or not you're willing to be obedient. He's looking for people of faith and obedience in what his plan is. And the greatest thing you can offer Jesus is your yes. Second thought this morning that I have for you is that Jesus' call to infinitely more will cause us to leave our comfort zone. I mentioned earlier that one of the things that I wrestled with back in high school was this, my call of ministry. But part of it was because I saw an uncertain and an uncomfortable future. That, that was it. I was like, God, but I may have to go places and do things that, that, that I won't necessarily enjoy or like. As many of you know, if you attend this church, I, I spent nearly seven years pastoring a church in the state of Illinois. It wasn't on my bucket list places to live. Like, God, why you could have sent me to Arizona or Florida or somewhere warm and said he sent me to Illinois. And it wasn't, and hear me, it wasn't a punishment. It was a place that God had called me in that point. And I began to understand it's not about my comfort, but it's about what he is doing. On at, le on at least three different occasions, and I thought this is kind of cool in the life of Peter. On three different occasions throughout the lifetime of Peter, we see Jesus both figuratively and literally calling Peter to step out of a boat. The boat literally in Peter's life represents his comfort zone. In fact, it was the thing he was trained to do from a young child. It represented his potential earnings. The boat would have represented his, his wealth. It was kind of everything. And Jesus, in this first encounter, says, Peter, listen, come follow me. Come follow me. Step out of the boat, get out of your comfort zone, and come follow me. With each step of obedience, Peter experiences infinitely more than he could have ever imagined. In fact, I want to take just a moment and walk you through these this morning. First, we see the scene that we just read, right? Peter in the boat with Jesus. Jesus teaching. He goes out. He gets this huge catch of fish. And when it's over, Peter lays eyes on Jesus. It sees that there's something more. And when you read the end of verse 11, Peter says, it says, what about Peter? That he left everything and followed Jesus. Peter's second time that he's both figuratively and literally called out of the boat is during a storm. And to me, I, re I recognize that in this preparation phase that these disciples are in and that you and I are in, that Peter's about to experience one of the most incredible things on earth. In fact, he's about to do something that only he and Jesus would ever do. In fact, let's, let's read this together in Matthew chapter 14. 
Matthew chapter 14. The picture is familiar. They're in a storm. And starting in verse 25, it says this, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But immediately, but Jesus, excuse me, but Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. I seriously doubt when you go back to the first text we read that Jesus could have, or excuse me, Peter could have ever imagined that that momentary decision to follow Jesus would have led to a moment where Peter had the opportunity to walk on water. Now listen, it's easy to focus on what comes next in that passage, right? Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. What, what an incredible metaphor for life. Takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. And before he drowns, Jesus reaches down and saves him, which tends to be the pattern of a lot of our lives, right? But here's Peter experienced this incredible moment with Jesus. Not something he could have ever imagined or thought of. Before we get to Peter's third time where he gets out of the boat, out of his comfort zone, Peter experiences something that maybe you are you have experienced or you are experiencing now. And I want to talk to you, for just those of you, for just a moment to say, Pastor, I've heard what you've said. I know what God has said, that there's infinitely more, and yet you don't know the things that I've done. In fact, most of the time, the biggest thing that freezes us from being obedient is personal failure in our lives. We experience personal failure, and that personal failure causes fear, anxiety, and worry. Jesus, you could never use someone like me. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. This is the night that Jesus had been taken prisoner by the Romans. This would lead directly into his death on the cross. And in Luke 22, we find this scene in verses 54 through 62. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into a house, to the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. Verse 56, a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, speaking of Jesus. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Remember, this is the fulfillment where Jesus, sitting around the Passover meal, would say to Peter, you'll deny me three times. Verse 60, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Because of the fear that gripped Peter at seeing what was happening to Jesus and what might happen to him, he denies ever knowing him. On three separate occasions, he fails the one who believed in him when maybe no one else did. And it's interesting to me to see where Peter goes in that moment. You see, when we fail or when we feel like we fail, when we have fear, we tend to surround ourselves with the things that are comfortable. In fact, we see in Scripture that Peter goes back to being a fisherman. In fact, very quickly, Peter goes back to his former way of life. As Jesus dies on the cross and is laid in a borrowed tomb, many of the disciples lost hope. In fact, on the day of, on the Resurrection Sunday, we talked about this, uh, they were hiding 
in a room together. In John's gospel, in John chapter 21, verse 3, we see this, this picture being played out. Peter says this, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into their boats, but that night they caught nothing. By the way, in a mirror image to the passage we read earlier, they're about to have another miraculous catch of fish. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? Listen, failure is never fatal, and it's never final. Don't allow failure or difficulties to push you back into your comfort zone. Understand that if you've made mistakes, that if you've had difficult situations, if you feel like you failed God, and maybe in some ways, like Peter, you're like, I, I did fail. I want you to hear me. Jesus isn't done with you yet. Whether it was a failure of sin or just a failure of fear, God hasn't given up on you. Failure is never a reason to give up. It may push us back to our place of being comfortable, but as we'll see in just a moment, even after you fail, God's not done. For third thought this morning for you in your notes, Jesus' purpose remains even if you fail. Listen, our failure doesn't remove Jesus' purpose in our life. John 21, 7, just a few verses after we just read where they went back fishing, it says this, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. This is after Jesus' resurrection. And as soon as Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And if you read the passage on, uh, he, he was going to get to Jesus first. That's Peter. He's going to get there first. This is the Peter that had denied Jesus three times. But this was the Peter that understood that Jesus still loved him. Peter's third step out of the boat happened when Jesus calls him back after his greatest failure. He calls him once again from his place of comfort and familiarity back to a place of obedience, back to a life of infinitely more. And listen, this morning we can be thankful that Peter did because in a, sh in a few short weeks the day of Pentecost is going to happen. And when the day of Pentecost happens, it's Peter who stands and, and, and declares who Jesus is, and thousands of people come to know him. Peter continually has the opportunity to experience infinitely more. But hear me, listen, Peter wasn't perfect. If you read the scriptures, Peter, even after that, continued to struggle. He said, Pastor, what does that say to us? It means that although we understand that Jesus is infinitely more, that failure is a part of the process. The failure leads us to a new place of obedience and a new place of trust. Can I encourage you this morning, don't give up. Peter didn't know what was about to happen, but Jesus did. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reminds us that God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound and shame the wise. In fact, he says, listen, not many of you, speaking to the church at the time, were wise by human standards when this whole thing happened. And yet God chose you. As I was praying through this message this week and sharing what I believe God wanted me to share, I thought back to a moment in my life, and there's many of these moments. I wish I could say that, that you know, I had obeyed enough or that I'd taken enough steps. But listen, this idea of getting out of our comfort zone, whether you like the idea of a boat or something else, Listen, this idea of being obedient regardless of our abilities, uh, about coming to a Jesus that loves and cares for us, about experiencing infinitely more is a series of choices throughout a lifetime. I was 29 years of age. I'd been in youth ministry for seven years, and I heard God whisper into my ear, it's time to make a change. I began to pray with my wife, and we, be, we, we entered into an agreement to the next few years of our life to submitting ourselves to some training and schooling. Listen, I'm really glad being on this end of it that it's over, and I'm really glad on the other side that, that knowing the cost that would be paid 
to be obedient, I'm glad I didn't know what it was going to be. But I can just hear me this morning. I don't want to ever do it again. But I am so glad today to be on the other side of that thing. My wife and I stepped out of full-time ministry for a, a short season. I say a short season, it was actually three years. And I went back to school, finished education, did some things that uh, I knew God was calling me to do. And I can tell you today, it was the hardest and one of the best seasons of our lives. It caused us to question a lot of things. It caused us to reprioritize. It, it was an incredibly, uh, it, was, it was an insane season for us. We had to put ourselves in a position of trusting God and God using other people to, to help meet needs. And it was a really uncomfortable place. And yet God showed me so many incredible lessons. So you say, Pastor, what do we do with today? Well, there's a couple of things. I have a couple of challenges today. One, if you're listening, you're joining us today, and you don't know Jesus, listen, just like Peter was asked to follow Jesus in a physical sense to be his disciple, he's saying to you today, follow me, be my disciple. There's some of you that you just need to position yourself in a place of being obedient. You would say, Pastor, I honestly have kind of given up on the whole idea of God ever doing anything. You've spent far too long, long focusing on your lack of abilities instead of recognizing that it's him that has the ability. He just needs your obedience. And the third group of people I want to talk to today are those of you that feel as though that you have failed. Hear me, I'll say it again. Failure is never fatal, and it's never final. God is not done with you yet. You say, well, how do you know that? Listen, if God were done with your journey here on earth, you wouldn't be here anymore. But you are, so he's not done with you. So if you're a believer today and you find yourself in one of those camps, either, you know, I need to say yes to being obedient. And you say, pastors have a cost. Absolutely. Peter's cost for obedience was leaving everything he knew. I'm not saying that's going to be your cost, but I am saying it may cost relationships or lifestyle choices or, or greater commitment. And we should never be afraid of those things. Why? Because it opens the door to the infinitely more. I hope that none of you that hear my voice this morning are just satisfied with okay, are just satisfied with status quo. Because when I read my Bible, that's not what we've been called to. We've been called to a life of infinitely more, a life of daily picking up our cross and following him. Now let me talk to those of you that are believers and you're dealing with failure, with fear, with anxiety, with worry, stuff in your past, things that have went on feel like you've made the big mistake. Satan's the one who wants to condemn you. Jesus is the one, just like with Peter, after Peter denied him, who wants to come alongside and said, listen, I still have more. So I want you to begin to pray. If you're a believer, you're in either of those two camps, would you just begin to seek him right now? And let me talk for just a moment to those of you who are maybe far from Jesus. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, God's word is very clear that if we We'll confess with our mouth and we'll say, listen, I'm lost. I've got sin in my life. I don't have a good relationship with Jesus, but I need to. So if we'll confess that with our mouth and then believe in our heart, believe what? Believe that Jesus is the answer. That when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that's it. He's the one. Believe that Jesus died in your place. And when he died, he took all of your sin and he canceled your debt. And then on the third day, he rose again to new life. You say, well, Pastor, why is it important to believe that? Because we have a living Savior. A Savior who took away your sin, and he lives today, and he sits to the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for you. And he wants relationship with you. If you're willing to do that today, I want to pray a prayer with you. It's a simple prayer. I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to repeat. If you're a believer already, begin to pray. Man, listen, you need to tell the devil to knock it off with the Reminders of your failure. Some of you need to be willing to be obedient. So would you pray? And I want to pray for you. If you don't know Jesus, repeat this prayer with me. Just simply repeat the words I pray. Dear Jesus, I'm asking you this morning to forgive me of my sin. I recognize I need you. Come into my life. Change me. I give you control. 
I want to be obedient to you. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. Father God, I just pray for your people this morning. God, as they're sitting around their computers and their TVs, as, as we worship together today, God, I pray that you would challenge us now from your word. God, that we wouldn't read about you having infinitely more for us and just say that's, that's a great promise for someone else. But that like Peter, we wouldn't give up. And that no matter how often you call us out of the boat and out of our comfort zone, no matter what happens in the midst of that, that we would continue to experience the infinitely more. God, I pray for those that are dealing with failure. God, I pray right now, Lord, that for many of them, that as they step back in and press back into all that you have, that they will see, like Peter did, greater things than they'd seen before. God, I pray for those who have been stuck and paralyzed by the idea of obedience, God, that you would just God, touch their heart today. God, help us to wrestle with your word. God, may we apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I love you guys. I love having the opportunity for us to 